Um, so I'll introduce Alan briefly, even though you all know him. Um, the father of Axon, the, the creator of everything you're going to play with, hopefully after today, everything you're using already, and hopefully here to give us the most amazing pep talk known to man. <laughs> it's over to Allard. <laughs> Thank you. Very interesting with all these trip wires. I guess that's part of a chaos experiment. <laughs> Let's see what happens if we put Allard on a stage with a lot of wires and a pretty expensive, I guess, uh, guitar. All right, so uh, yeah, how do, you, how do you continue a conference that started with a, with a guitar and, and music on stage? Um, my, my talk is slightly, it has a different, let's say, order of magnitude to it. But um, of course, I want to, uh, to explain what, what are we doing and what are we we're heading for as a, uh, as a company. Um, and. Um, as a kid, I was really bad at history. I did not understand the sense of learning what happened in the past. And that's, that might be strange, looking at what I'm doing right now, uh, storing all of history so that you can learn from it. But actually, the best way to look into the future is, is to know where you came from. So I want to, uh, to take you a bit back, not all the way to the Stone Age or uh, medieval times, but maybe to the Stone Age of, uh, of Axon. Now, the, the story of Axon started in, uh, roughly in 2009, maybe in 2008, uh, slightly, when um, I, was, I was hitting some problems in, in, in the software projects I was working on. And Russ already mentioned that there's this, this increasing essential complexity in the systems that we build. But I was noticing that the software, the complexity of the software that we were building had a lot of accidental complexity to it. The software that we built for a, let's say, complex environment was much more complex than the environment itself. And, and to me, that was a problem. So I started to, to investigate. And I, I started an experiment. And the, the period of 2009, 2012 was more of an experimentation phase. And that's where the first code was written, but actually also where people started to use this in production. Um, you would think that, that, well, that could have been a chaos experiment. Let's see what happens if we use this software in production. Um, and many of you probably know this story already, but there's production and there's production, right? There's the, oh yeah, we had an Excel sheet to manage something, but now more than one pe person needs to work on it. So let's build a system that supports two people working concurrently on on our Excel sheets, our administrative system. So I asked those people, okay, what, what are you using Axon for? What's the purpose of your system? Um, well, they said it's, um, it's a system in the medical domain. Okay, yeah, still have Excel sheets in the medical domain, I guess. Um, and we are using it to track tools used in surgery. And that was pretty scary. Um, that was, um, my, I, I, my response was really, are you really, really sure you want to use my experiment for that? You're, you're putting stuff into people and then relying on my software to tell you whether that stuff is actually safe to use. Um, they said, well, we tested everything and it was all right. And that gave me the confidence to actually start using it myself. <laughs> it's true. Um, I'm not sure if uh, my, uh, my personal uh, experiments are uh, over here. Uh, there's uh, there's two, uh, two projects simultaneously that felt to me were a pretty good fit. Um, I guess I have a 50% success rate because one of the companies still exists. The other one, I'm pretty sure, was not because of Axon. And of course, then we, uh, it's in production, then we started to support, uh, support Axon and it became, it became something real in 2011, more or less. Uh, so this was more or less the, the picture I could use for that, uh, that era. Um, it was a lot of experimentation. We, this was new stuff, right? CQRS wasn't even called CQRS when, uh, when we started doing it. It was called Distributed Domain Driven Design. And, and even today, I don't think CQRS is really the best term for it because there's much more uh, advantages to, uh, to be gained than just looking at uh, them as command and query responsibility segregation. Um, of course, I had my, uh, my failures in that time, um, and that's why 
eventually we had Axon 2, etc., etc. And I made some really stupid mistakes in that, in that first uh, uh, experiment, and it ended up using a framework to support CQRS in itself, right? So it was known as the CQRS and event sourcing framework. Um, and CQRS is a very nice way to split your complexity, the complexity of your application into different parts. Right? You, you cut it down to small pieces that hopefully even a human can understand. Right? We are nowadays building systems that none of us will understand. Yet we have to make it better and improve on it. Um, so we have to cut it down into pieces that we can understand and make them interact in a way that we still sort of oversee. And, and CQRS uh, is very good at, uh, at doing that. But what I noticed when implementing something like CQRS, you might have had something in mind, something really beautiful that you want to, uh, you want to build. But the problem is there's all these little frameworks and libraries, and basically it's up to you to put everything together. The problem is you only really care about a few of those things. And in this big mess, oh yeah, there's a steering wheel, very important, you don't want to forget that. In this mess, you probably won't even notice that the stuff that you got all the parts for will not really help you build the thing that you had in mind. You always end up in a different place than the one you originally had when you drew those first boxes and arrows on a whiteboard. Right? You always end up somewhere else. And this is overly complex. Right? If you want a car, well, build your own. Right? I guess that's uh, in the, uh, the 1900s something. That is uh, what, uh, what people had to do. Right? If you want a car, that's great. <laughs> Go ahead. And there's this other thing in, uh, in, in, uh, that, that we learned in those days, is that events retain value. Now, there's a lot of messaging uh, going around, but the events are very special. They describe something that happened, and they are part of history. They are part of the history of your system. And they allow you to learn about what happened, so either we can pr predict, quote-unquote, the future, we can set expectations of the future, or we can find problems in, in the past that we might have not discovered when looking at a, uh, a live system. And this really drives the, um, the event sourcing uh, uh, practice. Right? Use those events not as a, just as a side effect of your applications, but use them as the source of your application. Make sure that all decisions you make are directly using the events from the past. That's the only way to ensure that the events that you produce are a correct representation of what happened. And they explain the behavior of your system. Now, there's a lot of different definitions or explanations, mostly, of event sourcing. And I said definitions. I, what I've noticed is that most definitions are sort of aligned, right? Using the events as a source of truth for your application. The problem, then, is the explanation under that definition that gives you different stories. And I want you to, to warn slash inform you about those. Now in here you have a, uh, an architectural diagram, not very complex, it's probably made by a rightfully ignored architect, of an order service that emits some events that are used by another service that uses some smart analytics to decide what the pricing of the product should be or whatever doesn't matter too much. And that smart analytics process only uses the events as its source of truth. Hooray, we have event sourcing. Well, not really, uh, because the order service is making decisions based on whatever it has as data in its own little database. It's not using the events to make the decisions. They're just a side effect. So how can you guarantee those events are the source of truth if all the truth that you are producing is not based on the truth itself. What's very important is that you feed back all those events into the order service and that the order service updates its states based on the events it produced. It should consume its own events and that is essential in event sourcing. If you do not have that loop back you are not doing full event sourcing. You, ha you just have, well, just, you have a very valuable event-driven architecture, probably, 
but you cannot guarantee that your events are a true representation of what happened. And we learned some lessons after, uh, after 1.0, and uh, somewhere around 2013, we released version 2. <coughs> version 2 was more about, uh, about scalability. And yet again, we've learned a lot of lessons, because scalability is not as easy as, as you think. Um, and it's still not as easy. And if you think it's hard, it's probably even harder than that. And we started to, to improve on a lot of the, the APIs in 2015, uh, and it took us around two years to, to build Axon 3. That was a very long time, because we wanted to get it righter than the first time. Right? You never get it all right, but you can do, at least do it better. And in all these years, Axon was a side project. Right? It was a project that we spent relatively significant time on, but it was mostly two or three people one day a week um, um, kind, of, uh, kind of job. In the meantime, we did see a, a very interesting growth of adoption. So around two, 2016, something happened that made Axon a lot more popular. And of course, I would love to believe that that was Axon 3. But if you look carefully, it actually already started before the 3.0 release. So I cannot really take all the credits for that. The, the big change was microservices were getting a lot of adoption. And people were discovering, so yet again, other people discovered it. And I just stole the idea and pretend it's my own. People started discovering that the, the way Axon allows you to build software is very useful when building microservices systems. And of course, microservices, they promise a lot of, uh, um, a lot of agility and scalability of your, uh, of your systems, but it's very hard to build a microservice, it's very easy to build a microservices environment that doesn't deliver on those advantages. Right? It's very easy to mess up. The problem is microservices are really hard. We are back to that situation where we want to have a car and we have all the parts, all the individual parts. All the parts are made, but we still have to combine them together to make sure we have something usable. And it's not only the technology that is really hard, and making sure that we have our circuit breakers and our service discovery and everything in place, but it's also where do we split? What's in one microservice versus what's in the other? Right. There's a lot of microservices around, or uh, microservice architectures around, that have entity services. And a, um, a friend of mine uh, used a very nice term uh, for that, and uh, he called it noun-driven design. It's very easy. If domain-driven design is too hard for you, just try noun-driven design. It's a guaranteed disaster. The idea is you have a, a document describing what you would like to achieve, and if you don't have a document, just write your ideas, then look at it and find all the nouns. Underline them. Those are your services. All the verbs used in combination with those nouns, they are the API calls on your services. Great. Unfortunately, this is what happens in, in a lot of environments. Now, we, we would like you to build monoliths instead. Don't start with microservices. What's wrong with a good old monolith? Right? They're easy to deploy. They're much easier to refactor. The only problem is they're somewhat harder to scale and maybe move around. Is, uh... But they're often confused by the big ball of mud. The big ball of mud represents a system that is so entangled and there's no, no structure anymore that we've completely lost any possibility to change it. Right? I'm pretty sure nobody would really want to touch this big ball of mud. So just imagine it's your job to work with that little architect on top of it to improve that big ball of mud. And there's a big difference. We should not confuse the monolith with the big ball of mud. A monolith still has structure. We can still break it down if we want to without wearing gloves to protect us. So the strategy that we propose is somewhat different. And uh, this is especially for Jeroen, because he, he really likes my icon for, uh, for a business concept. I have an idea that makes money, right? 
That's great. And of course, we want to achieve that using microservices because it's cool. It's the technology of today. It allows us to recruit people, right? Um, yes, that's an argument I have heard of uh, people use. So that's our route. But this is an extremely difficult path, right? We are very likely to make big mistakes and end up with these entity services that are basically a distributed big ball of mud. It's probably the only place worse than creating a monolithic big ball of mud. Because now all the services depend on each other, and if one service goes down, everything is unusable. Right? Some people uh, compare the distributed, or uh, sorry, the entity services to a database system with an ACP abstraction. That's essentially what you're creating. You're, you have to join, you get an HTTP response, and then we do other requests to join that data with other information that we get, etc. So you just build a lower version, lower performance version of, of the same system. What we propose is go for that monolith, but make sure there's some clearly defined structure inside. And the thing Axon does to help you is provide you the, the messaging concepts, the commands, the events, and the queries that these components need to interact with each other. And as time progresses and the non-functionals or the all-functionals change, I'm not sure if that was intentional, but the all-functional requirements, uh, was that the intent of the, the words you used? Um, when they change, for example, the team size is growing, and it's unworkable to have the entire team work on the same Git repository. Or their, their focus uh, has to be different. Or maybe the stability of that little blue component down there is, um, is different. Maybe it's very unstable, or just very stable, or it needs to change a lot. Whatever the reason, you want to be able to take that apart. And preferably without changing the remainder of it in a significant way. And as time progresses, we can extract more components and scale them as we, as we please. So far, that's theory. The thing that helps us achieve that is what we call location transparency. And if people ask us now, what is the primary feature of Axon Framework? It's not CQRS. It's not the fact that you can build domain models is the fact that it gives you location transparency between the components inside of your application. That is so much more powerful than uh, being able to, um, uh, to split the commands from the queries. Location transparency is what allows you to extract these components. Because if two components are not aware of their respective location, it means you can change that location. And I'm not talking about HTTP, where you say, well, we use a, a DNS and, a, and load balancers to, to route all the messages, so the client doesn't even know where that service is. Because actually, when you have two operations on the same service, they'll probably share the domain and share lots of the path. What happens if you split those to different locations? What if those two endpoints you had in one service now have to be split in two? Which is basically the scenario that I'm describing here. You'll probably have to change um, one of the two uh, names. So location transparency is not even knowing in which service a certain operation is. Right? You just send a message, and that message will find its destination somehow. Now, it's very important if we talk about event-driven microservices, and we actually call this an event-driven microservices conference even. And it, it will make you believe that it's all about the events. The events are the big kahuna of software development. Well, they're powerful, but they're problematic as well. Here we have our beautiful order service again. And let's imagine we have another service that needs to know something about all these items that have been ordered. Right? Well, that's great. We've got events, right? We, we, just, we have an event bus. Uh, every service has its own database, of course. We have an event bus, and we can just connect our new service to that bus, and we receive all the events, then we know exactly what has been ordered. Right? It doesn't get any easier than that. Well, it doesn't. So these are the events that the order service will, will probably emit. Right? An order was created, items are added, items are removed, and then an order is confirmed. 
Now, when is an item ordered? It's when it was added to an order, not removed, and then confirmed. So there's a bit of mathematics in there that we have to do, and in this example is very simple mathematics. I've got a six-year-old that can actually do that. But it does get much more complex and, and intricate in, in, uh, in proper systems. And the problem here is that we are duplicating a lot of that logic to the other side. Right? Because if the only thing we really have is the, the, um, uh, is the events, we have to do some of the mathematics as well. The events will tell us what happened. We don't really care what happened. We, sometimes we just care about a certain end state of something. But it does get worse. This is an example that was almost exactly like this, presented like this at, at a meetup that I attended. And they, they were talking about the power of event-driven microservices and, and the power of events. So they had an order service, and it would emit an order was created. And that was great. And in the way they explained that, they said, we send that event to the shipping service, so that shipping can then confirm the inventory, and then emit another event saying the inventory was confirmed, and now the order service knows that there's enough stuff out there, so it can forward uh, send an event to the payment service that is ready for payment. And then the payment service says, yeah, it's paid. Great. And then the order service knows, yeah, and then I'm ready for shipping. Right. Now, what's happening here is that we, we have not removed any of the dependencies between these services. The order service is still very well aware of the fact that there has to be shipping confirming stuff um, and uh, a, a payment service getting paid for the stuff that you're about to send. The other thing we've done is invert the dependencies and making them much harder to trace and to find. Right? So now instead of the order service asking shipping, do you have the stuff that I want to sell, it's now sort of talking like this. So there is a, there's a dependency inversion. It's not gone. It's still there. It's just untraceable at that point. And that's because there's more than events. There's more than one reason for, for components to send a message. And we've identified basically three categories of, of messages. And I was, uh, was rightfully corrected by, uh, by Matthias uh, last week. Um, he's here as well. So um, Matthias, wherever you are, you were right, are you? <laughs> uh, I said, there's three messages. And he said, no, there's not. There's more. There's at least seven types of messages that components want to send. I said, OK, wh what are the other four? Well, it's a subscription. Said, ah, OK, great. It's a subscription for events, an indication that I want to start receiving events. So now I call them three categories of messages, and then we're good, I hope. He's still around, so we might have an argument later. So you have events. That is a notification that something has changed. You just want to tell, that, say that something has changed. You don't care about the actual side effects or what happens after that. Right. Then you have commands. You have an intent for the system to be in a different state. So you send a command, and you expect that some component will handle that command and put the application in a, in a state and trigger some side effects, right? And then you have a query, which is, a, I have a need for information, right? So the value in the query is not in the actual message being sent, it's in the return value, right? So probably there's a component waiting, waiting, quote unquote. <clears throat> you can wait asynchronously, of course. Um, and uh, the, the advantage of, or the uh, benefit of a command is the side effect that it created. And with an event, it's just sent. That's it. And they follow different patterns, right? And these messages are, are very different in the way that we want to, uh, uh, to route and, uh, and, and handle them. So commands are typically routed to a single destination. Right? We send a command, and some, components need, some component needs to pick it up and deal with the changes. Whereas events are a very typical pub-sub kind of communication. Every component that's interested will be able to handle it and do whatever it needs to do. The sender doesn't care which components they are. They're not coupled in space nor time. 
And then there's the queries. And for queries, we found three, uh, three patterns. The one that we call point to point, which is basically I have a question and I know there's a single authoritative answer to that question. Right. So a single component gets that question, give me the answer. Great, that's the answer to our question. But a lot of our systems nowadays don't have a single authoritative answer. You might have questions that have different opinions. Right? Every component might have a different opinion on what are your recommendations if somebody's interested in this product? Well, there's many different ways to give recommendations, right? You can find similar products. You can find the most bought products on the website completely disregarding the product that uh, somebody's looking at. Or do you want to compare, well, people that bought that product also bought the others, right? There's already three patterns that we can find. So in this case, we want to do a scatter-gather queries. Like, hey guys, give me your opinion on the recommendation for this product. And every component that has an opinion can then send that. And the last one is a subscription query. Keep me up to date on, right? I've got something that's changing all the time. And when it changes, just let me know. Give me an update. Slightly different than an event. That's more about, tell me what, what's, hap uh, what's happening. Right? So as we realized that, we, uh, we continued on the uh, 3.0 release. And um, adoption was increasing. And as you can see, it's skyrocketing at that point. Right? And this was amazing. And we decided to found Axonic. Last year, July, uh, we, uh, Axonic was, uh, was officially founded. And uh, we... Uh, we separated from our uh, previous employer. And then, of course, a lot of interesting stuff happened in this time. Jeroen already mentioned it. We launched Axon DB and Axon Hub <coughs> early in 2018. And we're very happy of the fact that still adoption was, uh, was increasing. And what we thought was an absolute high is now even higher, which is, uh, which is wonderful. The, um, The ecosystem has now changed. We now have several products to support the, um, the promises, so to say, of this location transparency. So we now have Axon Framework that allows you to build these components in, let's say, relative isolation using commands, events, and um, as of um, uh, 3.1, also queries. It took us a while to realize that query was actually a real, had a, we had a reason to, to make it a message. So it allows, us, uh, allows you to build those components. And then we have AxonDB and Axon Hub supporting you to, uh, to deliver on that promise of, uh, of, of scalability and location transparency. And the big player in this is Axon Hub. And, and last year, we presented uh, Axon Hub at the, uh, the conference for the first time, being the first conference that we presented anything anyway. And we compared it to the enterprise service bus. So imagine that you have a line explaining the, the smartness of systems. And this is not a, a quality grade, right? This is not if you're smart, you're good, and if you're dumb, you're not. But this is about how much does a system, a routing system, or a messaging system, understand of the messages that it routes. And an ESB understands them very well. Right? An ESB can do routing based on exactly the contents. It can do transformations, and it can do a lot of stuff. So what happens in practice, they do a lot of stuff. And in organizations, we build a department around it, because they're so powerful, we need a department to manage whatever uh, gets to the ESB. And that department becomes very powerful, so powerful that any deadline you have is broken. They don't care. You need them to make your deadline. And that's problematic. So what our industry does quite, uh, quite often is we go to the other side. Right? Dump pipes and smart endpoints. And that did work a lot better in many cases. And it does help for events, but it doesn't really help for, uh, for all of it. And even in events, there's some, uh, some situations where this is problematic. Um, I always believe there's a golden middle ground somewhere. And that's where we wanted to put Axon Hub. And it's not exactly in the middle. It's a bit further to the left. 
We, we have developed Axon Hub in such a way that it does not understand the contents of your message. Very similar to a message broker. The only thing it understands is the type of message that you're trying to send, because you say it's that type. If you say this is an event, it will know how to distribute that. If you say this is a command I want to have executed, it knows how to get that command to its destination and knows that somebody is probably expecting an OK or not OK. Maybe a little return value. When there's a query, it knows somebody's waiting for the result. So we were going to route this query in such a way that we can get the optimal result as fast as we can back to the sender of that message. So as I said, Axon Framework is the thing that sits in the middle, allows you to build a structured monolith, making sure that all these components are nicely separated, and that gives you the promise of being able to extract the components. But now we have a little bridge to gap. Right? And in that bridge, we need some messaging system. And probably, if we're using events that retain value, we need some storage. I'm pretty sure you know what I'm getting at. right? That's what these products do. And if we want to, we can continue. And we've got some demos. Um, um, We've got some, some demo material that we can show you that shows how this works in practice. And as these nodes are separated, it doesn't matter. Nothing else has to change. Right? You only change those components that you want separated. Axon Hub will understand that, oh, these messages are now going to that instance, and these are going to the other one. That's fine. And you can even scale. You can have a component. You can have multiple instances. And because we understand the types of messages that are around, we can help you route those optimally to their, to their destinations. And as time moved on, the downloads really got uh, out of control. Um, so I, well, I did this on purpose, of course. I drew it right through the, uh, through the arrow. Um, and uh, as you said, we, we crossed the 1 million download uh, line last month. Um, and we also see there's a hockey stick curve, and uh, all the time we hope that the hockey stick continues and it doesn't flatten out, right? And every month again, it's, it's usually somewhere around the sixth or the seventh day of the month we get these um, uh, these results. So if you if you talk to me in that first week, you might feel that I'm a bit edgy. That's because we're waiting for the results to come in, right? So if you have any questions, ask them after the seventh. Yeah, you'll, you'll be fine. So that's a reason for celebration. And the reason I like this picture a lot is, uh, first of all, there's not me on it. So typically, the photographer here has a uh, selection bias of picking me as a subject for pictures, and it was finally not the case. But it shows that we are celebrating, but we are definitely not done. There's work to be done. And of course, not by me. Um, there's work to be done, and we are not finished. Because we believe that the microservices evolution doesn't end here. It doesn't end at a point where we have a reasonably scalable system of VMs or nodes that we can scale up. Um, we see that the whole serverless uh, is, uh, is, is rightfully gaining momentum. But we also see that there's a lot of um, learning still left for us to do to be able to use them efficiently. And we, uh, we, f we feel that the way we can structure these components and the way they communicate is very useful in a serverless environment as well. Just imagine you can build your aggregate or your event handling component or your projections and just say, hey, Axon, here's a projection. Run it. Whatever. Whatever it takes. I don't care. Why should you care about how many instances of something you are running? You want to run exactly enough and not more than that. Right. That would be ideal. And of course, the ideal situation is not something we get to tomorrow, but it's something we're working towards. And for us, the first step of doing that would be to provide at least a SaaS solution of what we've got. Right? At least at some of the services that we provide currently, you have to, well, not physically open a box, but you do have to install something on a VM or on a um, uh, cloud environment have to install it yourself and manage that, and probably scale it. Um, by offering a SaaS solution, at least we take that part out of your hands if you want to. But there's something else. We, 
we were looking at our ecosystem, and as we were explaining, yeah, we've got the Axon framework, and we have Hub and DB, and, well, DB is pretty powerful, but only if you have a lot of events you want to store. Um, and, uh, and Hub is, is really cool either, because if you scale, then you can use Hub to make it very dynamic. But Hub really only works very well if you also have DB underneath. So it feels like, hey, you're trying to sell something to somebody. It's like, well, but if you really want to use this car, you should also buy something else. Well, if I need it, why isn't it in one package? Right. And that's exactly what we did. So we had Axon Framework open source. We had Axon Hub and DB commercial. And as of today, I can announce that uh, these products have been merged into a single one, which uh, for well, we're not good at naming things. We just, I like the names that just explain what it does, nothing else. Um, so we call it Axon Server. It's the server component that gives you the, the server-side features of what Axon Framework would need to scale. That makes it a lot easier for you to install that. Except that many of our users, they like open source. They download Axon Framework. They start, and if you use the Spring Boot starter, so who's, who's using Spring in combination with Axon? That's a lot. Who's, not, who's using Axon but not Spring? Well, is that selection bias, or is that a reliable market inquiry? Um, I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's a former. So the, um, the problem with the Spring Boot starter, or the, the challenge here, is it expects a relational database and starts creating tables for you in that relational database. And then if you want to scale out, you'll have to build components. You have to configure all these components. Maybe you're using Spring Cloud Discovery, or maybe you're using JGroups. If you really got that to work in a production environment, please talk to me. Um, I've heard uh, many interesting stories of nodes not being able to discover each other. So it's, it's fairly complex. And uh, so what we have decided to do is to open source Axon Server as well, making it available to you, allowing you to feel the, well, the power of it firsthand. But of course, as a business, this is a rather problematic business model. right? Uh, for some reason, we want to be able to support building open, uh, the, the open source framework. Um, so we need something as well, right? We, some, some of us need bread on the table as well in the morning. So we made a separation between Axon Server and Axon Server Enterprise, the Enterprise Edition. And Axon Server, unlike Axon DB and Hub, don't come with a developer edition that is limited or uh, restricted, so to say, in, in production use. The open source version is usable in a production environment. It has all the features that you must have to run it in a, in a production environment. So it does give you the, the insight of, of an application. It shows you what, how, what your application structure is like, what your infrastructure looks like. It will tell you, um, um, it, will, it will route all the messages for you and all that. It will store them for as long as you want. There's no limitation anymore on, on the amount of storage that you can use. But if you want to use it in a large-scale environment with extra reliability and extra observability, um, then you can move to, uh, to Axon Server Enterprise. And we also noticed that the current offerings of having multiple editions was rather complex. So we want to have a structure that is slightly simpler, where we have a few packs that you can pick and choose. They can provide additional features that you can use in specific situations, such as the skill pack, which is more of a world scale, so geographic scaling. What if you have a multi-data center setup? And you want to have rules, well, I want to have all of my events stored, at least in Europe, but then also have at least one backup of every event in one of my other data centers somewhere else, so that I can recover from a major storm in maybe North Carolina or Hong Kong or wherever your data centers are. Then there's the big data. There's, there's people storing massive volumes of events. We have customers storing seven to 800 million messages a month. Right. That might be challenging. In some cases, even uh, hundreds of millions a day. And then there's the security and compliance pack, which gives you um, um, the, the features that some of you might need for auditability or um, um, having 
um, encrypted uh, storage, right? making sure that all the events are stored are properly encrypted. In some uh, cases, field-level encryption. Stuff like that is part of the Secure Instant Compliance Pack. And this is the, going to be the default in, in Axon 4. And Axon 4 has been released, at least the first milestone of it has been released yesterday. So for some of you, I know that some of you have just moved to Axon 3, and I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> but I do promise that the migration of 3 to 4 is much smoother, is much easier, because not many of the APIs have changed. There's a, there's a few changes, but you probably won't notice. Um, Axon 4 is much more about giving you the actual scalability, not just the ability to scale, but also making it a lot easier to actually do so. So some of the stuff that we've done in Axon 4 is, well, it defaults it is a somewhat more hard restriction or hard default, so to say, to Axon Server. That does not mean you must use Axon Server if you want to migrate to Axon 4. It is very easy to fall back to the, uh, let's say, Axon 3 way of uh, uh, storing events. Um, we have worked to, to simplify the configuration a lot. But it, it should be a lot easier with Axon 4 to configure the very specific requirements that you have in your, uh, in your application. Um, we had a lot of uh, planned features that required some API improvements. Well, we made those improvement, uh, improvements in Axon 4 so that we can, uh, we can build those um, for you in the near future. And of course, if you want to try this out, if you have subscribed to, uh, to the workshop uh, I'm having this afternoon, um, you're lucky. I believe it's, uh, I don't know if it's full. Can somebody either give me a nod or a, yes, it's full. Okay, sorry. If you're not in that workshop, um, it will be public avail publicly available on October 18th. Um, why then? I don't know. We've got a, a webinar announced uh, or a webinar planned for that uh, that day. Uh, you can go to our website if you're interested. You can uh, you can leave your uh, your details and we'll notify you exactly when everything is available for uh, for public use. And I hope this makes you happy. Um, if not, give me feedback. Well, if so, also tell me. I'd like to hear some of the, the good feedback as well. Um, and uh, if you have any ideas or uh, questions at this point, I will, uh, I will take one or two. Or none, if there's... Yes. <laughs> So would it be possible to run Axon Server in the same application? Uh, it probably is. It's not designed to do that. It's, it's more designed. You can run it next to it, um, but there's no um, intent, intent to run it as an, embedded, um, um, as an embedded component. But it probably will work if you do. And then you would have a monolithic application, yes, indeed. I managed to get someone running around with a microphone. So this side is up next. Good, mo uh, good morning. Mark Kopelberg. Hi. Um, uh, you, showed the di you showed the diagram of uh, free services, which uh, were highly coupled due to the way they used events. Um, so what would be the alternative of the events if they were loosely coupled? Yeah, so what would be the alternative? Um, it would be to use queries, right? If you have an intent to trigger a side effect, if you have an intent to say, I expect at this point that, um, or I need to know if the orders or if the items I was ordering are available, ask it as a question. Oh. It was a question already, right? The, the intent of sending that event was clearly explained as this gives the other service an opportunity to tell me whether or not these, um, um, these items were available. If that is your intent, express it that way. That makes the system much easier to understand. It doesn't change anything on the dependencies, but now it puts the dependencies the way they really are. Right? The component that is sending the message has a requirement. If you express that requirement, it makes your system much easier to comprehend. Sir. All right, with that, um, we're uh, way over time, I guess. Um, thanks very much, and uh, let us know what you think. <laughs>